welcome back to the Cover 3 Podcast here on CBS Sports. That's Tom Fernelli. That's Danny Cannell. I'm Chip Patterson coming to you live at YouTube.com slash Cover 3 and all across the 24-7 Sports Facebook Network. Thanks for hanging out. Smash that subscribe, smash the like, and get access. Come and join us in the chat. Very excited. We are beginning the Cover 3 draft season, and it starts with the most important position on the whole daggum field. Punter. We're talking about quarterbacks. <laughs> uh, the quarterback draft, the 2023 quarterback draft, will be today. We will follow it up with the pass catcher draft, wide receivers and tight ends. We will follow that with the Oklahoma drill draft, offensive line, defensive line, running backs, linebackers, and, of course, the coach draft wrapping everything up. Um, this It's a great thing to do in June because it gets us just a little taste of of some of the individuals we are really excited about uh, in the 2023 season quarterback draft. We will review last year's draft and we'll of course have our draft uh, here four rounds, four picks uh, should be a lot of fun. We begin with a few headlines from over the weekend. Uh, the first of which being that the top player in the transfer portal has a destination. Former UTSA wide receiver Zakari Franklin has committed to Ole Miss. The portal King does it yet again. Tom, do you think that this uh, along with loading up a quarterback room with like nine players with starting experience, it's going to be uh, part of the plan for Ole Miss to have a more dangerous and maybe effective passing attack in 2023. Yeah, I, I think that adding a receiver, the talent to Franklin will definitely improve on a passing attack last year that just really wasn't all that effective for most of the season. I, I He's a very good player. Like I don't know how many fans like just casual national fans or fans of bigger programs are really aware of what Franklin was doing at UTSA. I just know that I had a front row seat. First of all, UTSA has been, you know, the dominant program in conference USA the last few years. Franklin was a big reason why him and Frank Harris were the, you know, a very deadly duo on offense, but I had a front row seat to it when UTSA came to Champaign a couple of years ago. And I think Franklin went off with like 12 catches, 150 yards, a couple touchdowns was just absolutely unstoppable. He's a, big bodied receiver he's not like a blazing kind of you know deep threat but he can get deep but what he does is he kind of you know he reminds me a lot of Traylon Burks who we saw at Arkansas a couple years ago in a very similar offense to what Ole Miss is running have a huge season and get to the NFL I think he could be that kind of player in the Ole Miss offense where like you get the ball to him on a shorter route he'll make things happen after the catch and he's hard to bring down in the open field I saw him a lot Friday night studio. We had a lot of UTSA yeah. games on there. Mm -hmm. We saw him. I like him too. I'm with you. I think he's going to uh, thrive in this system. And I do think it's about getting weapons. You know, I mean, Lane Kiffin came in here and that was something he hang, hung his hat on early was one of the NIL King, right? He was going to be the guy that owned it. And I would say this year, it feels like it's fallen a little bit short for them to kind of close here at the back end of the season with a player like this. I think it'll be huge for whoever's playing quarterback. I mean, the momentum from being, what, like 8-0 up in the top 10, and then you end up losing the last four of the regular season. You lose your bowl game as well. It it was a, It's complicated from the, you know, mo whatever momentum is worth. But, like, being able to, to double back and being able to collect these pieces, you know you've got Quinshawn Judkins is going to be one of the top running backs in the entire country. So what else can you do so that defenses aren't just going to load up um, to stop your stellar sophomore? Danny, I I'm going to start a sentence. You tell me how you think it goes. So Urban Meyer and Dan Dockage sat down to have a conversation about college <laughs> sports. How do you think that went? I love it. I got to find that interview. <laughs> um, so in a conversation with Dan Dockage, Urban Meyer had said that um, – it, the name, image, and likeness, and the NIL collectives. And he comes out and he threw out the C word. And of course, the C word being cheating. Urban Meyer says, quote, it's a fancy word for cheating, discussing the process of collectives going to all these boosters, getting the money, then figuring out who's going to get the money. Um, uh, of note, Urban Meyer sits on the board for an Ohio State nil foundation the collective <laughs> the collective uh all capital letters um when you danny when you hear urban meyer um you know going sort of down this rabbit hole does that at all change your mind about whether urban would come back to college football or sort of whether he would be able to still be successful in this environment no i think he's done i, I think you got to believe like after the opportunities he's had 
and how embarrassing the last one was, but you never know. I'll say this, I because I saw these comments, he's got the timeline wrong. Like he's just flip-flopped what actually has happened because it was cheating for the last 75 years while everybody was doing it. Now we found a way to make it legal. So he's just backwards in his wording here. It's like a bizarro world that Urban Meyer is living in that he doesn't understand that this is actually what's been taking place, but now it's above board. And yes, it's wild and it's there aren't any regulations, but you're allowed to do it now. So it's the exact opposite of what he's saying. That's the thing. Like, how could something that's not legal be cheating? It was cheating <laughs> when he was last coaching, but it's it's no longer cheating. So it feels like cheating, but it's not cheating. I, I will say, while I the words are wrong, I get what he's saying in that from what he's used to, from his perspective, it's like, you know, you got to think like why Urban's always had to step down from these college jobs because he just overworks himself too much. And he's like, you know, he just he cares just too damn much. You know, he's out there. He cares about these kids, but he wants to win all the time and he wants to win recruitments. And I think for him, in some twisted way, the fact that recruiting right now can just be reduced to we'll give you 125 grand, which is 10 grand more than this school is going to give you. I think that bothers him. I think that's what truly gets to him is it's like it's not about the most convincing recruiter. It's not about who's outworking the other recruiter. It's just, well, we've got more money than you do and we can pay more than they can. So we will win this recruitment. I think at the heart of it, that's what bothers him more than anything. I also think about the control freak in Urban Meyer mm-hmm. and wanting to be in total control of the program. And for him, the idea that a collective would have so much influence mm-hmm. on the recruiting process, that seems like another thing that has him, you know, freaking like he he can use the word cheating. It, he doesn't like it. Like that is not an environment where he would thrive if he had to go head to head with big money boosters deciding how they're going to allocate resources. That's definitely one thing that I can't see Urban Meyer wanting to be a, a major part of if he were to come back. Well, then he should go to like a Mac school. Yeah. A school without Bowling any Green. real NIL it's money. Just, yeah, pure. let's go back to Bowling Green. Let's get back to the good old pure days of being a college football coach just when men were men. Don't you think that's, you know, and I know Saban's comments have got a lot of play, and he stayed consistent to this for, you know, a year and a half of saying, let's just go pro. Let's just make it all above mm-hmm. board. That has to do with control, don't you think? 100%. Like, that's what that's all about. Is He doesn't like all the ancillary, oh, I have to listen to these guys just because they cut checks, they decide my roster. And I do think there's a lot of coaches who, as much as they didn't never want to go down this road, now that we're there, I think the power that they would have in being able to cut guys and saying, okay, if they're employees and I can actually get rid of the bottom 20 guys that are on scholarship, that it's real uncomfortable and I have to keep happy. If I can just get rid of them, then yeah, let's go all forward and let's move forward and go all in on the professional, you know, college football league. The amount of um, the relationship between Nick Saban and the money around Alabama football is fascinating to me. And I think we'll probably determine we all, we're always sitting here guessing how many more years do you think Nick Saban has probably depends on that relationship. Because if that's that's going to be something that's uh, that's interesting to track, particularly as things continue to move forward. Uh, speaking of the SEC, the debate around eight game versus nine game schedule, we enjoyed some of this right now. Tom's already shaking his head. They have announced no no system. They have announced no no rotations. They have just said it's it's going to be an eight game schedule with no divisions, and we promise we'll. We'll get the right games. They haven't said that it's going to be anything beyond 2024. And for those who who might have missed this in the last week during the SEC meetings, so the league is going to expand to 16 teams in the 2024 season with Texas and Oklahoma joining. And now they've got to figure out a way to put together a schedule. It will be an eight-game schedule. They didn't say 177. You know, they didn't give us any details about what it might look like. But they just, Greg Sankey said, well, we know the games that are going to be important. Okay. This is, sounds like a headache to me. Um, Tom, you sticking with your, uh, the, the C and SEC is for cowards? Cowards, yeah. cowards, cowards, cowards. Listen, the one thing that kind of just annoyed the hell out of me, I mean, the whole thing annoys me because it is, it's cowardly and it's posturing and it's political and there's a whole bunch of, you know, it's 
the cowards are the teams at the bottom of the conference because the Georgias of the world are happy playing a ninth conference game. They don't care. They know they're going to the playoff anyway. It's the schools that are afraid of missing out on bowl games that are against it. But when Sankey said, like, he's trying to justify it, and I understand, like, when you're the commissioner of any league, whether it's the NFL, a professional league, or like a conference, your job is to just take arrow after arrow for the idiots that, you know, you're running for. But when he said that, well, you know, we didn't want to rush in anything like we did with COVID, and he's comparing a decision on the schedule to the pandemic. First of all, Texas and Oklahoma didn't announce that they're coming to your league last week. They, that's been in the book works for a couple of years. You worked on this TV deal, what, 18 months ago? You're not rushing into anything. You're not, you're not, you've been sitting there sitting on your hands for the last 18 months. You've had all this time to come to this decision. And then you don't do anything. And at the end, you're just like, well, we don't want to rush into anything. Come on. You're just, I don't know. It's play. Everybody else is doing it. The ACC is the only, well, if everybody else is doing it, is a great reason to do something. But anyways, like the, the big 12 does it, has done it for years. Pac-12 has done it. The big 10 does it. The big 10 makes more money than you do. You don't think that has anything to do with it too, besides just the fan bases. They play more games. They provide more content. They get more money for it. Like your fans are spending how much money a year to buy season tickets and you're forcing them to watch a game against Mercer instead of another SEC school who they're lucky to see once every 12 years now. There are so many people who get screwed by this because they're too scared to have to play another tough game because we play in the best conference. We just don't want to play it because if you make us play more games against the SEC, we can't really build our entire reputation around the three or four teams that are actually good like we've been doing for years because more people will see that we're just like everybody else. We're just like Purdue. We're just like Texas Tech. We're just like Oregon State. We just play in a, in a league with bigger teams. That's the only difference between us. Bigger stadiums, too. It just yeah, well, that, Better fan base. Yeah, I'll give them that. Yeah, but oh, for I, sure. More passion. So don't you sure. think though, wouldn't you, if you were and because I, you know, I put out something like this and everybody's like, oh, well, they'll still win the national championship and Georgia can beat anybody. I would say not only the teams at the bottom are chicken, but I think it does have to do with getting the most teams in to the 12 team playoff. Cause Georgia's gonna, you know, the SEC champion's gonna get in. The runner-up's probably gonna get in, but it's that third and fourth team. And if they don't have to play nine. If they're a 10 win team, let's say if they're 10 and two at the regular season and they've had a couple cupcakes outside, which you all know they will, that enhances everybody in the conference as far as perception goes for who's getting in. So I think it is a lot to do about that. And my, my comment wasn't so much more of, oh, let's just pass the SEC. Why, why does the Big 10 still play nine? Why does the Big 12? Why don't they say, you know what? You guys have it figured out. The ACC is in this too, and it's no coincidence. The ACC has had almost as many teams in the playoff, just like the SEC, because they've gamed the system too. If you're the Pac-12, what do we always say about the Pac-12? Oh, man, they just they cannibalize one another mm. because they're playing each other that many times. That's why they get cannibalized, because they don't schedule the cupcakes that are in there. So if I'm just looking at the other commissioners who are – Clearly, George Klavkov has bigger things on his plate than worrying about eight or nine game conference schedule. But if you're the Big Ten, why not say, you know what? Screw that. I'm going to go to eight games. And but they, I'm sure that's probably in their TV deal that they just they're not cowards. They're not yeah. cowards. They know. know like, here's the thing. It's not smart though. It's business sense. If you want to match them and get in the and be perceived it, the same way, have more bowl eligible teams, have more ten win teams, have more teams in the playoff, and then you're the same, you know, perception. But it's it's a problem that doesn't exist because look at the rankings every single year. The top 10 is always filled with three and four loss SEC teams. Losses in the SEC mean more. That's the what the that's what the logo comes from or the slogan comes from. Like a team that goes nine and three in the SEC is always in the top 15. A team that goes nine and three in the SEC, as long as it's the right team and the right brand is going to get into the playoff as a college football, you know, as one of the at larges. Like look at the four team playoff. SEC teams don't even have to win their division to get to the four-team college football playoff. So if they go nine and three in the regular season, they're going to get one of those at-large bursts. Play the game, man. Like, I don't know. I just, I think, yeah. Hey, Kirby Smart, by the way, called it the, quote, most overrated conversation ever. 
Um, and he Kirby says, put anybody in front of me and we'll just beat the right. crap out of him. And but, I would too with his roster. And he was, he was thinking, um, you know, if you want to talk about the college football playoff selection committee, his big concern is will playing in the sec championship game hurt me. Like mm -hmm. what's going to happen. Like if we are starting to talk about those top two to three teams, do you get the advantage by sitting at home? Because that's exactly what you're talking about. Let's go back to 2017 where Auburn wins the SEC West after winning the Iron Bowl, goes to the SEC championship game, gets beat by Georgia. Auburn, not in the college football playoff. Alabama, into the college football playoff, even though they had a head-to-head -head disadvantage against Auburn, and they did not even win their division or play for their conference championship. That The coaches are all going to say, we, we're concerned about the selection committee, this, that, or the other. I think... I found it like an easy way out. I mean, I almost wish that they had given us a one seven seven. I wish they had told us what a format was going to be. Now it's just going to be throwing it together like a June fifteenth scramble. You know, we're just going to show up in the morning and put the teams together and come see on the board what flight you're in and who your partner's going to be. And that's that's fine. I'm sure the TV partners will end up getting better matchups out of it. By the way, TV and the fan experience. I would also say are reasons to, to go to nine just because ultimately I think you're going to get better games. The SEC currently has a requirement that at least one non-conference opponent be from a power five conference. Greg Sankey calls it one of our peer conferences, <laughs> but they don't have any peers. They're the what's best that, conference in the world. Mean? Only big 10. Are we not yeah. allowed to do the ACC anymore? Um, but they've, you know, they have great non-conference games on the schedule, Alabama and Texas, a non-conference game this year and last year as well is awesome. Like that is a fantastic game. Georgia has some huge games on the non-conference schedule coming up. The big dogs do go out there and get some great matchups. The guys at the bottom, not so much. Mm -hmm. Cause some of us are scared and some of them ain't. It's time coming up on the other side. It's time for the 2023 quarterback draft four rounds. Four experts picking, assembling the ideal quarterback room for this 2023 season. Next. Come and get it. So much new be this. When are you going to put those needles in? <laughs> Ow, my back. So much new butthead. Yeah, baby. Parenthood is cool. I now I pronounce you husband you. and husband. This is the happiest day of my life. So many all the reasons. <laughs> <laughs> To stay on the couch. Let the games begin. An all new season of Beavis and Butthead now streaming exclusively on Paramount Plus. Use promo code Nachos for one month free. Back here on the Cover Three podcast, welcoming in uh, a face who many of you know and uh, someone who you talk to. Those who watch live always get to see. Uh, we've got Jordan in to uh, to be the the proud owner right now of the. Do we, are we going to call it the uh, Governor Chip? He's the governor. Are we going to call it the BJ team? Or are we going to call it the Bud Jordan? I vote not the BJ team. <laughs> are we going to call it the Bub Jordan team? Bud Jordan? Uh, no, but, let's call it the BJ team for sure. Okay. Yeah. 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 We'll just be the BJ team. The BJ team. So Bud and Jordan uh, will be drafting for this one again. Uh, Bud off in summer school working on that eligibility right now. Thanks to all the work that he's been doing, putting in. Uh, on this summer school opportunity. Before we begin with the 2023 quarterback draft, Tom, you are going to be on the clock. Let's look back at 2022. Okay. Tom had the first pick again. And by the way, I did do a random number generator on this one. And Tom <laughs> came up again. Tom had CJ Stroud, Dylan Gabriel, Sam Hartman, and Aiden O'Connell. Bud, who was in the two spot, ended up with Bryce Young, Hendon Hooker, Brennan Armstrong, and Grayson McCall. I was in the three spot. I got Caleb Williams, Quinn Ewers, Cam Rising, Malik Cunningham, and Danny was on the turn at number four. He had Devin Leary, Tyler <laughs> Van Dyke. Conference of quarterbacks, baby. <laughs> Blake Chapin. Wow. And Cade Klubnick. Woo. Danny. <laughs> Now, did I get to keep Cade Klubnick for this year, right? Like, it carries nope. over because he was an nope. underclassman. He was, like, my backup now. I mean, do you have, like, a first-round grade on Klubnick this year? I mean, you can give up your first-round pick. Oh, um, 
Yeah, that was that's a tough scene, Danny. I don't, yeah, that was brutal. That's a, this is a little bit of a uh, a tough scene. So uh, we listen. Those weren't the only like misses here. Max Duggan, uh, second team AP All American, was not selected. Drake May, uh, the ACC Player of the Year, was not selected. Michael Penix, the second team All Conference quarterback from the Pac-12, behind Heisman Trophy winner Caleb Williams, was not picked. I think that. Uh, the debate's going to be, oh yeah, no Anthony Richardson as well. Uh, nobody wanted any piece of Will Levis. No uh, one still would take Anthony Richardson. No one. They were, Except the Colts. <laughs> no Stetson Bennett uh, anywhere on that. I I think this is a Tom Chip debate. Who who do we think won? And uh, chat, please feel free to, uh, to weigh in as well. Who do we think won uh, last year's quarterback draft? I won. Boom, problem. There we go. Debate settled. I won. God, yeah, I think so. No, oh, I had a strong one. It's just mine's not. It's just so far out of the conversation. It's really like who's the big loser. <laughs> Bud's first two is. picks were really strong. Yeah, I think it drops off because Brennan but, Armstrong yeah. didn't have a good season. And while Grayson McCall was still solid, I don't think that there was dominance. Um, obviously, I've got Caleb. And Quinn Ewers up and down. Cam Rising won the Pac-12. Malik Cunningham solid. Tom with uh, Tom's deal breaker to me is that Aiden O'Connell got Purdue to the Big Ten championship game. Mm -hmm. That was against uh, the best defenses in the country. Yeah, Um, yeah, definitely, definitely not DK. But listen, that's that's why we've got this year. We've got this year to be able to uh, to get it going. All right, we will as we turn the page to 2023. Tom, you are on the clock. Who is your pick? I saw a comment earlier before the show started that said, if I have the first pick and I don't use it on Quinn Ewers, I am a fraud. Uh, well, call me a fraud because I'm taking Caleb Williams. I mean, I, I love Quinn Ewers, but this is this is a gimme. Like, how, how do you not take Caleb Williams with the first pick of the draft? You're like, I would, I would accept an argument for Drake May if somebody really felt strongly about it. But just based on everything we saw, I think this one's pretty obvious. I think Caleb Williams exceeded my expectations last year. And I yeah. had very high expectations. He was my first round pick last year. I thought that he was going to be stellar. Like the the things that he did to throw USC on his back in November won him the Heisman Trophy. And it was everything that you imagined in terms of him being able to take the next step. He was number one on my board. I think that Caleb Williams in the sort of overall quarterback discussion it's tough for me to come up with another one right there. Agreed. All right, Jordan. Don't mess this up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, <laughs> the the BJ team with our uh, with our first pick is going to take. Uh, we're going to take Drake May. Okay, Drake Easy May. Choice. There we Easy go. Number two on my board as well. Why do I have the third pick if I suck the worst? Oh, I did random number generator. Like if you take all of us and put us alphabetical order, it's one through four, and then just run it, and it went four. Danny was, one, Danny was tanking, three. and he got screwed. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want this pick, but I'll I'll go with the third selection. Give me the Homer pick. Give me Jordan Travis. Mm. Let's go. And I think it's not only is it about the year that he put together last year, it's about the weapons that uh, have been accumulating around him that uh, Norvell has been giving him. And he's gotten better every single year. I thought Keon Coleman was huge. Um, you got Johnny Wilson coming back. There's mismatches across the board. Uh, the tight end from South Carolina. You just have weapons galore deep backfield the offensive line they hit in the transfer portal like i think he's going to be set up for a huge and i i don't know if their defense is going to be just dominant so i think they might actually have to score a lot uh so i think that's going to bode well for jordan travis what i love is that jordan's on the show but he's trash talking you in the chat right now <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's asking in chat is jordan travis a reach michael Penix is still on the board <laughs> hey, I, I don't <laughs> think jordan travis is a reach it's I, definitely not a reach I, you can make a that's why i didn't want to have the third pick because i i knew i'll be getting a call uh, called homer but I, i'm still good with it i like the pick i 
I've got him at number five on my one through 16 Mm -hmm. in terms of tiers. I think he's very much in that below Caleb Williams and Drake May conversation, but it does give me the opportunity at the turn to get my number three and my number four overall quarterbacks. We begin in Austin, Texas with the man who cut his hair and told that famous boy to sit down and play third string. We are going with Quinn Ewers from Texas. And then to start the second round, we'll head out to Seattle and pick up Michael Penix from Washington. You're not worried about too many egos in that room. Like, you know, they're both, they're both trying to, you know, improve their draft stock this year, Chip. Like Michael Penix came back. Quinn Ewers is planning to go to the draft. I don't know. You might have some, uh, you might have, have some, some bruised egos sitting on the bench there. No, these, these are hardened personalities. They are both transfers. They both started in the Big Ten and then, you know, had to take their talents elsewhere to really thrive. They've seen some stuff out there, Tom. They are going to be ready to lead the way in the modern era. Um, a quick question from the chat is, uh, does the, the Wisconsin transfer to Florida make the board? And you're not allowed to call him Graham Mertz. I think he's just have to be called the Wisconsin <laughs> transfer to Florida. Um, I I really don't want to give my board away, but I am not afraid to say that the Wisconsin transfer to Florida is not on my board. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Danny, back to you. Uh, second pick of the second round. I'm telling you what, I am rattled off last year's picks. It's really throwing me off. <laughs> hey, t- hey, Devin Leary's still, the out, there, Devin <laughs> still the out there, Danny. Devin Leary's still out there. You had this kid, Klubnik. <laughs> <laughs> um, gosh. I'll go. Screw it. If you have this many weapons around you, you're going to be good. Give me Kyle McCord, Ohio State. Ooh. It's a very solid pick. Mm-hmm. Thank you. That's where I was going to go. Feel sorry for McCord. He's going to have a terrible year and get benched for Devin Brown now that Danny's well, taking well, him. Well, <laughs> if one of these times it is going to happen, it'll be my luck because they've just been just firing quarterbacks out there. They're in the Heisman Hunt top passing category every across the board. He's going to be the one that gets leapfrogged. Um, not happening. The high school teammate of Marvin Harrison Jr. will be just fine. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Don't, don't want a quarterback forget. out there wearing number 33. Come on. Let's go. <laughs> All right, Jordan, back to you. Uh, hey, I make sure we don't get sued for that, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't be ESPN. It would be NFL, right? They own it. I don't know. This is a parody of a draft. <laughs> yeah. We are not actually talking about the NFL draft, and so therefore under fair use, since we are using parody, we should be okay. Um, tough choice here. I think um, – <laughs> I think the the BJ contingent will go to the reigning uh, national champions and we'll take uh, Carson Beck. A couple of new starters. Yeah. Let's go. Second round getting spicy. BJ, BJ contingent. contingent. Really like good vets on the board. A teenager. Um, all right, Tom. <laughs> What's uh what's what's your second round? Let's let's go ahead and finish second round. Then we'll uh, we'll hit a break and come back and finish. All right. Um. Well, there's one quarterback left on the board who has been to the college football playoff twice. He's won two Big Ten titles, and I think he's gonna have a pretty big year this year. Give me JJ McCarthy. JJ McCarthy. As I was sitting breaking this down. He was really good at the end of the year, right? Mm-hmm. You remember they, they had some injuries and, I mean, obviously Blake Corum goes down, but I just remember that for a long stretch in the middle of the season, it seemed like he wasn't trusted. And then near the end of the year, the playmaking really showed up in a big way. I was impressed by J.J. McCarthy as a whole. I like that. I also had a second round grade on J.J. McCarthy. Now this is where things get kind of confusing for me. Well, not confusing. I just it's difficult because I want both of these guys, and I'm trying to figure out if there's a chance either of them will still be available when it gets back to me. I doubt it. So I'm gonna go upside because I kind of know what the one guy is, and I expect him to have a good year. 
This one's still more of a bit of a wild card, but he, he could be a very, very good player. Give me Drew Alar. Ooh. Man! I, I just think, I mean, obviously, he was, he's the five-star play, re- recruit. Didn't get to play last year, really. He had some spot duty, but Sean Clifford was, you know, the, the Jag plus for Penn State. But I think that, like, you think back to when Trace McSorley was at Penn State, who was probably the best QB Penn State's had in a while, you know, no disrespect to Sean Clifford, but I think McSorley was better. And, you know, they 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 won 11 games. They won 10 games. I think they won the conference one year, at least they got, yeah. So I just think that he's the thing that they've kind of been missing on offense. Somebody who could kind of push things more vertically than Sean Clifford was really capable of doing consistently, which could take that offense to another level because they're going to have a good offensive line. They're going to have good running backs. That defense is going to be very good. So if Alar can live up to his potential as a quarterback, I just think that's a team that could take a big step forward this year. So I feel like that's kind of a lottery ticket. That That's the kind of pick I think that could end up once again leading to me winning this draft when we're back here next year looking back at him. And we're like, Danny, why would you draft Jordan Travis? He was injured all year. Oh, oh no, oh, don't oh, wish oh. that on Jordan Travis. Boo. Uh, yeah. Boo. All right. Coming up on the other side, we have already seen last year's Heisman Trophy winner, several returning starters at top programs in the country, a couple of first-year starters selected. We're about midway through the 2023 quarterback draft. We'll come back with the rest of rounds three and four next. It's finally here. Took you long enough? The moment you've been waiting for. Can we get on with this, please? The movie critics and audiences love is now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. You can't deny the people what they crave. Oh, we got him now! It's fairly wonderful. Oh, I got a good feeling about this. Dungeons & Dragons, Honor Among Thieves, rated PG-13. Now streaming on Paramount+. Plus. Taking a look at what we've got so far. Those of you who are watching along on youtube.com slash cover three, you see the draft board on the screen. Tom has three of his four picks already. He got Caleb Williams in the first round, JJ McCarthy in the second round and drew Alar in the third round. Uh, But in Jordan club, BJ is got Drake may in the first round, Carson Beck in the second. We await uh, their third round pick here in a little bit. Danny with Jordan Travis in the first, followed by Ohio State quarterback Kyle McCord in the second. And I've got Quinn Ewers in the first, followed by Michael Penix in the second. Jordan, you are on. And by the way, I love this because I I put together my big board, about 19 names coming into this, and I whiffed on Drew Alar. Didn't have it. And then Tom (sighs) says Drew Alar, and I'm like, of course, that was a, an excellent name that I should have added to my list. The chat right now is going crazy. There's you know so much surprise that we haven't heard from some names, like, and I don't want to influence everyone, but we haven't seen a Bo Nix. We haven't seen a Sam Hartman. There is belief that Will Rogers is being disrespected out here. Questions about Chandler Morris. I love the way that this draft sort of gets that conversation going about the top quarterbacks in the country. So, Jordan, we are where are we going with the third round? Uh, the BJ duo, we, uh, we thought about this one for a little while. Um, <clears throat> really can't believe he fell to us, but we're going to go with Bo Nix. Mm-hmm. That was who I, I was trying he, to decide yeah. against with the Lar. It's like, slid. you know, yeah. yeah, you know, you're going to get solid production from Bo Nix. Buds in the chat to wants to know who his team got so far. <laughs> They're pretty solid. I mean, you took about- Stetson Bennett with the first pick. <laughs> he probably is pissed off to know that we took a Georgia quarterback. <laughs> That's, we tried to draft Stetson Bennett and they gave us Carson Beck. We hit the vending machine yeah. and it just spit out a different Georgia quarterback. Um, Bo Nix has an upside argument going into the 2023 season that includes being a contender for the Heisman Trophy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm although I'm not criticizing, the, especially at the third round. It's definitely one of those names you couldn't let slide. How close to that upside is your projection for Bo Nix right now? He will, he will be I a top. tapped out. Yeah, I think if you get what you got last year, you're thrilled. Yeah, which is good. It was a really solid year. I just don't know what else is left there. Yeah. I think if you're Bo Nix, 
the reason you're back at school is one you probably got paid a pretty decent amount and compared to where your draft stock was going to be you're probably maybe getting paid more to stay in school another year but two i don't think you're coming back because you you're trying to improve your draft stock from a how good i am angle like i think you're like you're saying danny he's tapped out bo nix is bo nix but i think that another solid year to show that it wasn't just a one-year kind of thing could maybe solidify his stock as far as a mid-round pick and then maybe you know there's plenty of talk about like caleb williams and drake may being great quarterbacks gonna be like one two in the draft after that i don't know what the real depth of next year's qb class is so maybe bo nix felt coming back for a year he could maybe be a third or fourth round pick whereas this year he'd have been a fifth or sixth so I think you're getting a very good player. I just don't think we're going to see anything from him that we haven't seen. It's probably about where I'm at right now. Danny, uh, you've got Jordan Travis. You've got Kyle McCord. Where are we going in the third round? So you guys realize there is a player out here who has 110 passing touchdowns in his career. I heard it's a record. It is a record yeah. for the conference that he played in last year. Give me Sam Hartman. Little mildly concerned that Tommy Reese left, but I still think Notre Dame like is going to be worst case nine or 10 wins. He's going to have a good year. He's got veteran leadership. The dude has played a ton of football. Curious to see what it's like without the mesh uh, concept that he you know played so well there at Notre Dame, but he can still ball out. Give me Sam Hartman. Incredible beard. Like just commands a room with yeah. it. I mean, he's got a modeling career on the back burner mm -hmm. if it doesn't work mm -hmm. out. Remember his Peaky Blinders hat from ACC Media Days last year? Yeah, yeah. That guy just watched a whole lot of Peaky Blinders and went ham with Came it. Came walking in like this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that pick, Danny. He was number six on my board. Um, I think you've got a lot of good value there. All right, I've got, I'm in a precarious position because I've got Quinn Ewers, I've got Michael Penix, and these are my final two picks right now, the last pick of the third round and the first pick of the fourth round. There are some some names up here that are are respective uh, respectable um, names that are higher, but I also want to make sure I've got some good uh, representation. You know, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. But we first are going to just take um, an incredibly prolific and productive quarterback who I think is going to be that way again. Final pick of the third round, we go with Dylan Gabriel from Oklahoma, mm -hmm. and then for the first pick of the fourth round. I'm going to skip over some names I like, but I got to make sure that uh, that we give some love here. Give me Michael Pratt from Tulane. You son of a... So that closes out Chip with Quinn Ewers, Michael Penix, Dylan Gabriel, and Michael Pratt. Just took the top two names left on my board. Mm. Mm. All right, Danny, your final pick. God, I got some I got some names to go with too. I know we that's the thing is like it had I don't know if those of you have been with us for a long time. When Barton introduced this idea, he I mean, shocker, future general manager <laughs> of a power five program, wanted to talk about roster management. He was like, I want to have you know, one or two starters, I want to have one backup, and I want to have one flyer. So we're building for the future. And the problem is, is we put all of our drafts on this nice little graphic and we shared it on social media and we were like, who won the draft? And, and I'm going to date myself a little bit, but the internet reacted essentially with versions of what are those? <laughs> because they saw eight names that they knew and eight names that they'd never heard of before. Mm -hmm. And they were like, how in the world with 15 to 20 proven capable starters at college football, not getting drafted. And Jaquindon Jackson is getting drafted when he was going into his freshman season at Texas. Like this is um, an interesting exercise because so many names, even if we go just proven guys, end up not making the cut. Um, makes it makes it fun to uh, to get things started as as we talk draft season here in June. All right, I'm swinging for the fences like the Colts did. Right? They don't need to see a lot. Don't do it. They just. <laughs> <laughs> there's a quarterback why not and if you're gonna go all in you might as well go all in give me Cade Klubnik I took him last year yes. this is the year now we've gotten rid of that antiquated offense mm. we're gonna open things up Garrett Riley the biggest offseason hire at coordinator anywhere in the country is gonna be calling the shots it's gonna be a big year for Cade Klubnik who you'll see squaring off against Jordan Travis in the ACC championship game the, listen, 
Cade Klubnik, the honorary fourth round selection for Danny, can oh, also yeah. be the fourth round. No, yeah, can he also be the fourth round selection next year too? <laughs> possibly yeah once Good again game. all right so danny's closed out jordan travis kyle mccord sam hartman and Cade klubnik um jordan how are we closing it out um the bj squad we uh <clears throat> i was sent a list of of names from bud this morning and he included about five backups on there <laughs> and that just ain't me i'm not gonna do that <laughs> so really it came down to two guys I thought about the homer pick of Joe Milton. Mm -hmm. I'm going to decide against it. I'm going to go Austin Reed, Western Kentucky. Mm. Love it. Stat patter? Yeah. Stat patter. Solid. <sighs> no, I get it. You're, you're chasing stats with the fourth round pick. I get it. But I Why can't not? believe you just passed up on Joe Milton. <laughs> <laughs> I had a like, third round grade on Milton. I mean, That's I thought you were a vault. Is, Jay. <laughs> you just stabbed your team in the back. I really do feel like it. Well, so. I appreciate it because I'm taking Joe Milton. Give me Joe Milton. Oh, I'll no. happily take that as my fourth round pick because he's playing wow. in Josh Heupel's offense. You want to talk about quarterbacks who put up numbers, he could easily throw for 4,000 yards and 35 touchdowns himself if he gets things worked out. Man, thank you, Jordan. Thank you so much. I hope Joe you just enjoy has durability issues. and your Bahamas Bowl. I'm taking uh, Joe Milton in the Orange Bowl, baby. <laughs> Joe's just got some durability issues. I just worry that he's <laughs> he's not going to play all season. Can all we right. do another four rounds? Because I, I there's not enough rounds to pick. Well, that you have to, and that's what leads. I mean, we're we're going to get the names that just made the cut here in just a little oh. bit. Uh, it's it's tough. Uh, and again, it's tough even going with the iron sharpens iron. Let's try to try to get out there with a room development process. All right, Tom has. Uh, he went from the one spot, Caleb Williams, J.J. McCarthy, Drew Alar, and Joe Milton. Bud and Jordan, Team BJ has Drake May, Carson Beck, Bo Nix, and Austin Reed from Western Kentucky. Danny from the three spot got Jordan Travis, Kyle McCord from Ohio State, Sam Hartman, remember he's at Notre Dame now, and Cade Klubnick, and I got Quinn Ewers, Michael Penix, Dylan Gabriel, and Michael Pratt. Uh, those listening at home, feel free to reach out to us and let us know. Those in the chat, who do you think won the draft? We'll let that fill up, and, uh, and, and now as we turn our attention. Who else, Danny, if you could go four more rounds, if this thing was turning right around and you were going to get another pick, what are the names that you were, um, that you were upset with? Didn't able to, weren't able to get some shine. So Jaden Daniels, I'm shocked, didn't go. Uh, beat Alabama last year, SEC West champ. He was right. I, I was considering going with him over Cade Klubnik, but I'm stubborn and I wanted to make sure my pick from last year carried over. Uh, I was going to take Jaden Daniels because I was, I thought Jordan was going to take Joe Milton. Like, so I was just like, all right, well, I'll just finish with Jaden Daniels and I'll be happy with it. And then Jordan stabbed his quarterback in the back. And I took him just to teach him a lesson. I, I probably, in a vacuum, take Jaden Daniels over Joe Milton. But for the purposes of entertainment. And for the purposes track. of making Jordan feel bad, I took Joe Milton. <laughs> um, I Jaden Daniels, obviously. Cam Rising. I mean, yeah. all he's done is won the Pac-12 two years in a row. I, I had him last year. I, I thought that that would have been another good one. Now, speaking of Jaden Daniels, how about Jalen Daniels from Kansas? I think was uh, another good selection. Frank Harris from UTSA. If you wanted to continue down the uh, the group of five mm -hmm. route, Curtis um, Rourke was on my board. Curtis Rourke from Ohio is another good one right there. I I kept sliding KJ Jefferson down, and I kept sliding Devin Leary down, and I don't mm -hmm. think it speaks as much to their quality as a college football player as me just being tired of them. That's unfair. <laughs> it's, just, it's it's a little bit of the Bo Nix. I know who you are. Who you are is very good. You are a, a quality starter at the Power 5 level, and that means you are a very good college quarterback. But I was uh, I was definitely distracted by some some other names and more intrigued by other names as well. Uh, who else stands out on the uh, – who else stands out from names that didn't end up getting picked? Will Howard, Kansas State. A little bit. Oh, Brandon Armstrong. I had him on the list too. Yeah. I just, I don't, with Robert and I. 
yeah, I just I, I need to see that before I'm willing to draft it. If we're only going four rounds, you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, he had he was so bad last year. Tanner Mordecai brought up in the chat. I just his like, spring game spooked me. Yeah, I just I, and I've mentioned it a number of times in his career, and I know he was at SMU, but SMU has sent some players like NFL receivers on that roster the last few years. When they played Power Five teams, he did not perform very well. So I'm kind of spooked about that. And I just don't know if Wisconsin's offense is completely ready to run that. You know, I think I think Braylon Allen is still going to be a huge part of that offense. Um, if I had known who Alabama's quarterback was going to be, I think I would have had that guy on the board. But since I have no idea who it is, I didn't have a single Alabama QB on my board. None of the options. I don't know about you guys. No, I did not have any of the options. Um, Riley Leonard, I would have taken over Brendan Armstrong. Feel like I think Riley Leonard's a top five quarterback in the ACC, for but sure. That's you can also fill out the bottom of the ACC. You you can fill out the bottom of those rankings pretty quickly and be moving up in the in the world. But Riley Leonard is solid. Um, Cam Ward from Washington State, obviously a, a lot of um, hype and excitement, but I I would say that it was a little inconsistent last season. So I'm gonna sit and wait on that one. And Shador Sanders. Deion Sanders, Deion Sanders, Deion Sanders, Colorado, 2023, Shador Sanders. Now he's going to be a producer like Arch Manning. <laughs> Didn't make my list. No DJ Uyunglele either. Did you have any do not draft? <laughs> I think that I do not drafted <laughs> Bo Nix by sliding him down so far that I didn't think that he would. like. I, if he was still available, then I would take him. Oh, I Spencer had, Rattler was my Spencer do not draft. Do not draft. <laughs> Same, but it makes it sound so bad, like it's a character thing, but it's just you can't trust what South Carolina is going to be, what he's going to be. I actually had Dylan Gabriel on do not draft. Oh, why? Ooh. Health and uh, Jackson Arnold Jackson playing behind Arnold. him. I yep. think could like, and if that season isn't going the way, that, I mean, I think their win total is nine, nine and a half. Mm -hmm. Like if it falls short of that early, then you could see a switch you know, pretty early there. Um, DJ, I said, that was it. That was but, those ones I was like, and I think like Chip said, like Bo Nix, I was like, I kind of hope somebody else takes him because he deserves to be on the list, but I don't want him. Yeah. You know, a name I, I had on my board that I had absolutely no intent of drafting, but is somebody who I think is a sleeper could have a big year. Clay Milton at Colorado State because last year, you know, Jay Norvell goes there. They're bringing the air raid. They kind of just transitioned. Millen played as a freshman, got a lot of experience coming back for year two. I think if that offense is a little more in place, we could see Colorado State throwing the ball a lot, putting up a lot of yards. So I think stat wise, Clay Millen is somebody that could have a big year. Talia. Yeah. Talia could put up uh, big numbers. He's losing um, some of those offensive weapons there, but. Um, I like what they did in the portal, though. That also, was, I, Frank Harris, I considered, but the jump to the American, losing Zakari Franklin, losing mm -hmm. some pieces there, a little bit worried about you know what the season could be for him, but I like him a lot. And Tyler Van Dyke, a selection by Danny Cannell last year, did not. Cade Klubnick made it from one year to the next. Tyler Van Dyke does not. He does have a, a new offense and a new offensive coordinator um, working in his favor after last year's struggles, but didn't make my big board uh, as a top 20 quarterback going. I'm into still a believer. Just not. I'm a believer in TVD. I'm not a believer in his situation. I mean, talking mm. about him, like he was a first round pick of the future Heisman yeah. contender. If you put TVD on Alabama or Ohio state, he would be a first round pick. I'm telling yeah. you. That's what Alabama was saying when they were yeah. trying to get <laughs> That was their pitch. That was their pitch. What are you doing? <laughs> well, somebody somebody got together and, uh, and and was able to make it happen for Tyler Van Dyke. Again, if you're watching at youtube.com slash cover three, uh, you see the 2023 cover three quarterback draft, the board in its entirety. Caleb Williams, J.J. McCarthy, Drew Allard, and Joe Milton for Tom. Drake May, Carson Beck, Bo Nix, Austin Reed for the Bud and Jordan Team BJ combo, uh, Jordan Travis, Kyle McCord, Sam Hartman, and Cade Klubnick for Danny and Quinn Ewers, Michael Penix, Dylan Gabriel, and Michael Pratt for Ship. I, I, I love draft season. This is a whole lot of fun, and, and we appreciate those of you who join us live and are able to offer your commentary. 
I know that some of you are listening to this, you know, while you are maybe doing chores or you know in the carpool line and, and you're yelling out names too. And so we love uh, all your reaction. Feel free to give us your feedback, holler at us on Twitter, send us an email and the like. We will be back on Wednesday. We've got quarterbacks. So now we need pass catchers, wide receivers and tight ends, the cover three pass catcher draft, along with all the other news and headlines from around the country. That'll be coming up on Wednesday. Come join us live at 11 a.m. Eastern time. And you can follow him on Twitter at Danny Cannell. You can follow him at Tom Fernelli. You can follow him at Mac Mayton. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. See you.